Okay, so this is the last video in the electromagnetism series, and um, after this we should have finished the um, chapter 22. So, um, in this video we're going to explain uh, the forces between two current, two current carrying conductors, uh, as well as learn to predict the direction of a force, as well as learn to calculate the magnitude of a force. And that really is just uh, learning how magnets interact together. And the other one is we're learning to compare, uh, this is just an extra point of through one so we can finish off the syllabus, which is comparing the um, gravitational, electric, and magnetic fields. So let's begin with um, our two, magnet, uh, two wires interacting. So basically there's only really two possibilities. We, when we have two wires, so I'll have my first set here, and my, sorry, and my second set here. I'll differentiate the colors so that it's easy to see. Uh, so basically, either the current can be running in the same direction, or it can be running in opposite directions. So all we're really looking at here is, um, in this example, let's say this one um, in the same direction, and in this one here, we're running in opposite directions. So logic would tell us that essentially these both become bar magnets, well, not bar, they become magnets, and logic would tell us that one of these would retract and one of these would repel. But how do we know which one does which? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer first and then I'm going to explain why. Basically, when they move in the same direction, these two will experience a force towards each other and they will attract. And they will kind of make one very, very strong magnetic field. And when they're moving in opposite directions, they will repel from each other and they will make, uh, their magnetic fields will kind of cancel each other out. So let's um, look at the one where they're moving in the same direction first. So if we look at it from the top down view, Remember using our arrow notation again, let's pretend they are going into the page. Now if you use your right hand grip rule, point your thumb into the page and you'll see that the magnetic field in this case will be moving clockwise. So here we go, moving clockwise like that. And we'll make co-centric circles like that. Like that. Okay, now what we have to realize is that magnetic fields theoretically extend forever. So I'm just going to make sure all of you are clockwise. So you see, I've kind of broken my rule here. Remember when we learned about how we're drawing magnetic fields? We have to make it so that the lines never touch across. But over here, they are touching and crossing. So how do we resolve this problem? Well, the reason they can never touch or cross is because there can only ever be one magnetic field in a certain area at any given time. What happens is magnetic fields actually interact with each other and they kind of cancel out or merge. So these two magnetic field lines will either and make each other stronger or they'll make each other weaker. Um, because they are both going in the same direction, that is, they're both going clockwise, they'll actually combine together and make a more strong magnetic field. So what happens is you kind of get an effect like this. So this is not actually what the field lines look like. In fact, what happens is you get a field that looks like this. Uh, draw it again. So there's my line going in. They may have their own local magnetic field going that way that way and then they kind of combine to make this kind of large magnetic field they kind of just become one magnetic field because as you know all magnetic fields combine if you think about it all magnetic fields theoretically radiate to an infinite distance and therefore at any given point in space anywhere it is a combination of all the magnetic fields in the universe just all interacting and then the strengths and distances combined kind of make up Make up where, make up how strong the magnetic field is at that position. Luckily, they are, all magnetic fields have very short range, so this is kind of negligible in most cases. But you just know that all magnetic fields radiate out infinitely, and all points are just a summation of all magnetic fields, magnetic fields at that point. So they kind of, kind of combine, and they'll, they'll, these will attract towards each other. So um, I'm going to show you a picture of that, so you can kind of see what that looks like. So here's a good picture. So here we go. Basically, when the currents go in the same direction, you can see that they kind of combine and then these will move towards each other. But when the currents in opposite directions, the magnetic fields actually cancel out and they start repelling each other. Now you might be wondering why they are attracting or repelling at all. And this is really because when you have a wire carrying a current, you, as we've just learned, that they create a magnetic field. They basically become magnets. And here it is. It's just like bar magnets. When bar magnets are, are like, as in the fields are orientated, like this one here, they attract towards each other and combine the magnetic fields. When the magnetic fields are opposite each other, they repel and then the magnetic fields cancel each other out. Just like this. So that's an explanation of why they attract and repel. 
So if we just look at the oppositely moving, sorry, if we just look at the oppositely moving magnetic field, so that's one going into the page and one coming out of the page, um, the one coming out would be going this way, and the one going in will be going that way. And then you would kind of have a magnetic field right through the middle, and then you have kind of lines just going away and away. And the lines are kind of, they're just kind of, you know, repelling and cancelling each other out. So, yeah, basically, here we go. Like that. And this is quite a bad drawing, but you get the idea. So this will be, we'll be moving away from each other, we'll be repelling each other. So how do we actually calculate the force um, that these magnetic fields create? Well, let's go back to our equations. Remember what we learned, let's remember our equation that we learned. Um, F equals... Well, our basic equation is this one, again, V cross B. Um, but remember, we transform this equation by making V L over T and Q over T equals I. So, F equals I, and let's call this I1. I1 distance over magnetic field. Okay, so basically, um, what we have to kind of take into account is that when you have two wires like this. It's the, this wire moves because of the magnetic field of this wire acting on it, and this wire moves because of the magnetic field of that wire acting on that. And the um, interesting note uh, we have to make here is that the both, how, effect, how much it's affected by the magnetic field, so how affected it is by a magnetic field, as well as how strong of a magnetic field it creates. Both these factors are determined by the current in the wire, as we see I1. So let's say we're looking at this one. So let's call this one here, let's call this wire here number one. Why, why number one? So this magnet is generating a magnetic field as well as being pulled in by the magnetic field of number two. So that we can see the force on it is equal to I1 times the length. Remember only the length that is exposed to each other is will have will experience a force of attraction. And the more that's exposed, the more of attraction. So there's a the length here. Um, let's call the length, say, two meters. And then we have to times it by the magnetic field of this wire here. So what's the magnetic field of this wire? How do we figure that out? If you remember before I briefly described the magnetic field as being in the last video as being mu I over two pi r. Now all of these are constants except I, and you'll see that B is actually directly proportional to the current. If you double the current, you double the magnetic field. But what I is this? I is the current of I2. Sorry, my 2 doesn't actually come out as a 2, but I2. So I is actually the current of I2, so this is I2. And if we sub this right back in, and if we can kind of ignore the cross product because they are, um, they are right next to each other, and the magnetic fields are kind of, the magnetic field will be anti-parallel, going into the page, and then this will be anti-parallel again, so sine theta, again, will equal, will equal 1, so we don't have to worry about that, and we know about unit vectors already going, uh, changing the direction of the magnetic field. So, um, let's take these two formulas and kind of combine them together, and see what the force is. So, just to write that up again, so again, if, actually I'll draw my lines for us, so let's draw my two lines there, so there's my first wire, and there's my second wire, so, there's 1, and there's 2. So, let's take a look at what the force will be. The force equals, as we know, the I of the first current. So, that's, that's this is saying how susceptible it is towards magnetic field. The greater the current, the more it is affected by a magnetic field, times um, the length exposed, which we said was 2 meters, times, and this is a B. The B, which we said is mu, which will normally be the permeability of free space, because we normally do it in air or vacuums, where they're quite similar. So 2 pi r, and all this is a constant, and the only thing we worry about is the i2. Now look at that, i1, i2. So the force is actually equal to i1, i2, distance between them, and then times this huge constant, which is mu naught, 2 pi r. So let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at, uh, an example. So let's say that L is 2 meters, and then uh, the current in this one is 1 ampere, and the current in this one is 2 amperes, just to simplify our lives. And let's say the distance between them is 2 meters. 
uh, let's just say the distance here is 2 meters. Let's do a calculation. So we'll bring back Wolfram Alpha. And here we go, Wolfram Alpha. And also let's take a look at what the permeability of free space is. Uh, permeability of free space... Uh, permeability of free space. Here we go. Right, so the permeability of free space is... Here we go. Here's a constant. 1.2 times 10 to the power of negative 6. That's the permeability of free space. So let's do this. I1 times I2. So it'll be 1 times 2 times the length, which is 2 meters. Again, 2 meters. Times 2... Uh, M mu naught, which is this value here, time uh, divided by this new value here, which is two pi r, two times pi times radius, which we said was two meters again. So let's take a look at what Wolfram says our force between the wires will be. So Wolfram says the force will be approximately forty-eight point three newtons. So that was pretty simple, and as you can see, because this um formula 48 newtons so as you can see before because this formula takes into account i1 i2 the force on this one towards via and the force on this one towards via is actually the same thing and this kind of falls in line with all the other things we've learned you know newton's laws um every force experiences an equal and opposite reaction and this formula proves it no matter which way you look at it uh, it will be you know it will come up to the same formula i1 i2 l m naught over 2 pi r mu naught so uh, that's kind of an explanation of how you figure it out. And remember, same wires moving, the current moving in the same direction means attraction. Wires moving in opposite directions equals um, uh, repulsion. And then the force of repulsion or attraction is worked out by just combining those two formulas. The formula of a um, the current the magnetic field created by a, a, a wire as well as a force experienced by a wire in a magnetic field. And combining them, you get I1, I2, L, uh, mu naught. Uh, over 2 pi r. Very good. So now let's cover the second point here. Describe and compare the forces in uh, gravitational, electric, and magnetic fields. So let's do a quick comparison. So in a gravitational field, I'll just make the color a bit more visible. So in a gravitational field, the source will be a point mass. The field intensity will be uh, followed by inverse square law. That is. That is, you know, for every every time you double the distance, this uh, field gets four times weaker. And then um, the range is very long, and the direction is always towards the center of masses. So that, that means that means they always attract. The strength, however, is relatively weak compared to other forces. The electric fields, on the other hand, they have the source. They are also they are point charge. Um, the field intensity also follows an inverse square law. So there's, you can already see some um, similarities between these two. The range, however, is short range. Um, and the direction can be repel or attract. Or attract. It can, you know, put light charges uh, attract and light charges repel. And the strength, however, is much, much stronger than you get with um, gravitational fields. It's strong. Finally, uh, the magnetic field, which is what we've just been looking at. The source is always a dipole. It's not a point source. Um, you can't just kind of get one thing where magnetic fields radiate out from. You always have a north and south end. Uh, the range of it is also short, similar to the electric field. And the direction, again, is repel or attract. Uh, sorry, but I missed out a point. A field intensity, that's right. So a field intensity, this one, it just follows a normal inverse law. Um, the reason there's no inverse square law is because there's a dipole instead of a point charge. But you don't have to worry about that too much. Just know it is an inverse law. And uh, the strength of it is also very strong. And this one can um, direction... Oh, we've done direction. So just by looking at it, you can kind of see that all of them have similarities to each other. But they are all fundamentally different. Um, you see the sources are the same here, the inverse square law is the same. Ranges are the same here. Directions are the same here. Strengths are the same here. Um, you can really, really easily see the differences. So you just remember the properties of all three of these fields, and you should be good for your exam. So uh, thanks for listening, and join me next time.